Good morning, baseball fans, and welcome back to Dan's Vintage Baseball PC. Do not be fooled by the fancy name. It's just me and some friends talking about baseball cards. And a uh, really exciting show today. Um, this is a show I've been working on for a little while, and it's changed formats over the time um, that I've been thinking about it. But uh, I always had this particular person in mind for coming on this show. And um, my guest today is Orlando from A Collector's Dream who, if you know um, YouTube and YouTube baseball card, uh, this is somebody who you undoubtedly follow and know of. Uh, Orlando is um, universally known as the nicest guy on YouTube. And it isn't just his niceness, it's also his collection, which as you see from his videos, is just particularly awesome. And one thing about Orlando that I don't think people speak about, and I notice this on every one of his videos, is his eye. He's always got his eye on, on these cards. And every time I see one of his cards, I say, that card was picked out by somebody with a great eye. So anyway, without further ado, let's talk about the topic here, which is um, the Cuban stars of the Major League Baseball. And you can't really talk, start talking about uh, Cubans and, and American baseball without talking about uh, this gentleman. Um, his name is uh, Esteban Bayan. This is his... Um, First page from Baseball Reference. Uh, unfortunately, they call him Steve, which is the Americanized version of his name. Uh, Esma Bayan was born in Cuba, interestingly enough, to a Cuban man and an Irish woman. Uh, and he came to the United States to attend school. He went to uh, Fordham. And while at Fordham, uh, learned the game of baseball and ultimately uh, was so good at it, he actually became a professional baseball player for several years. But what's more important in terms of Bayan is his um, influence on the Cuban game because he went back to live in Havana and he established um, the Havana Club, which became one of the uh, most important baseball clubs in Cuba. And when we bring Orlando on, we could talk about Bayan a little bit more. But uh, just wanted to start out by bringing in the most important person in terms of the, I guess he's known as the the uh, Abner Doubleday of Cuban baseball, so to speak. But um Anyway, so let me bring on uh, bring on the expert and uh, Orlando, sir. Hi, Dan. Doing great. Nice to see yeah. you. Thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. I know you're uh, you 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 do appear on a lot of shows that uh, so your time is limited, and of course I've seen all your videos. So you're spending a lot of time going to shows and meeting with friends, and and really enjoy your channel. So thanks for coming on, Orlando. Thanks, Dan. That's, that, it helps being retired so I can kind of do all those little things and visit the card shops and the card shows and spend time on YouTube. But uh, yeah, really appreciate yeah, my, you having me on. My, my stuff is limited pretty much to the weekends, which is why I, uh, you yeah. know, because I work full time still. Um, so I, I, I've seen your collection. I, I think asking you to go through your talk about your collecting history in a, in a long version would take a long time. But um, just if you can, just give me a, a sort of a, a you know, a summary of how you started collecting and how you got into the position, so to speak, that you are now. Yeah. Well, I mean, like every little kid, you know, we I played Little League uh, with my friends and the uh, my neighbor actually was the coach. So I played Little League and uh, there were four brothers and they collected cards and that's what got me into the cards. So I started in the late 60s, became a um, really diehard collector in 1970, where I completed my first set from PAX. And from then on, I, I built every set. And I pretty much collected the entire time uh, until I got out of high school. Then I went to college, I got married, and maybe took about five years off. And then I started collecting again in my uh, in my mid 20s. And I've never stopped. And at one time, I was a, a, a part time dealer doing card shows and things like that. And I did that for oh man, probably 15 years. Mm -hmm. and just basically a, a collector and been in the hobby all of my life now over 50 years have you always been in south florida yes okay well i, I i've been in other places in florida but i've lived only in florida i've lived in tampa and places like that but mainly i've been in florida okay um so the topic of this uh, this show is the, the Cuban stars of, of Major League Baseball. And, um, you know, I, I I wanted to have you on because I know that you you have a Cuban ethnicity in your background. And I, I don't want it to be a situation where I'm, I'm you know, sort of 
being, you know, just what's the word for it? I, I, I don't want to pigeonhole you, so to speak, you know, because I know you well, you have an awesome yeah. mantle collection and you have, a you know, all these other collections. But I feel like you're kind of an expert on this topic. And that's why I feel like well, a good person. as a as a yeah, as a person born in Cuba and my family all came from Cuba, originally from Spain, but really we've been in Cuba for all my mom's life and my dad's life. Um, and, um, you know, I was born in Cuba, came here when I was just a young kid. I was only four years old. So I really don't know Cuba. I don't remember much about Cuba. But luckily, I had my parents and my grandfather and all that that really got to talk to me a lot about Cuba. And my grandfather, uh, my mom's father, owned a couple of grocery stores in Cuba. And he sponsored a, uh, a team over there. You know, because over oh. there, the, the, they were sponsored by, by the businesses. So he sponsored a team and he actually had a couple of professional players that did come and play here. One of them was Orlando Pena. Mm -hmm. And he came and pitched here in the United States. And um, you know, so my dad, told, my dad and my grandfather told me a lot of stories. And my dad used to take me to the spring training games. And uh, one day my grandfather took me to one of the games with the Orioles here in South Florida. And Orlando Pena was on the team and he took me down to meet after the game. You know, back in those days, you could just go on the field right after the game. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, he, the, the Orioles, he took me right? down. So I met Orlando Pena. I got his autograph. Orlando Pena right. took me as a little kid down to the dugout. And, I, and that's where I really met Brooks Robinson and Jim Palmer and Boog Powell and Al Bumbry and Paul Blair, all those players. And that got me really in deep, deep into, the, into collecting. This is uh, Fort Lauderdale, right? In Fort Lauderdale, yes. Yeah, because I actually went to that stadium in, I don't know, the early 90s. Um, was yeah. it Com Commercial Avenue, I think? Yes. I forget. Yeah. I, I had a place in Delray. For, and for and they, also played, they, also, they also played in Miami Stadium in mm -hmm. Miami also before they moved to Fort Lauderdale. And that's where I went to see them most of the time. Oh, okay. It was the okay. old Miami Stadium. And that's where the old, original Miami Marlins played. Yeah. And they were mm -hmm. kind of like that. So uh, this is a baseball card channel. So uh, <laughs> let's get into the cards. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was um, not just uh, Bayan, who doesn't have any cards, unfortunately, but um, Marsans and, um, Almeida. and Almeida. Yeah. Almeida has a card in the T207, which um, I just put a bid on in eBay this morning. So uh, yeah. I'm following you on that one. And then um, Marsans. And, and I guess these two guys were uh, the first Cuban players in Major League Baseball after the turn of the century. And they were teammates on the, um, the Cincinnati Reds, right? Yes, yes. All right. Well, let, let, me, let me back up a little bit further. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, Cuba, the history of baseball in Cuba started in 1863. And that was with two um, university students that went to a university in, in Louisiana. I don't remember the exact name, but they played baseball there in 1863. And they brought the, the baseball, the bat and, and equipment to Cuba back in those days. And that's where they kind of started playing. And then Esteban Bellan was the one that organized the league and organized the teams. And right. he was the first player since he did go to um, Fordham University. He right. learned English. So he came and he became the first Latin player in the, in the majors, even though he, I think he only played 60 games, but he, he was the, the and then he became, right, of right. course, the, the father. He was right. the father of baseball in Cuba. Right. He, right. And he played for a couple of teams um, in, the, in, in the United States in the sort of 1860s, the, uh, 70s. That, um, so go ahead. I'm sorry. He played for the New York Mutuals and the Troy Haymakers. And, and those days, you know, they were professionals, but, you know, there weren't real, the leagues were kind of crazy in those days. But anyway, uh, Bayon went back to uh, Cuba and he started the, uh, the Havana club, the Havana team, and he started mm -hmm. the, the professional. So he became the father there of a professional baseball in Cuba. So the big stars there, really was Almeida and Marsans also played uh, and they both played together and Marsans spoke English, but Almeida did not speak English. So Mar the story is that Marsans came to Cincinnati to interview, well, Almeida came 
to interview with the Cincinnati club and brought Marsans in as a translator. But Marsans <laughs> was one of the players, you know, but, but he basically, they didn't know who Marsans was. So right, at that right. time, they came and, you know, they played and they, and then Almeida, you know, they, they showed that they were both players and, you know, Marsans said, yeah, I, I also play. At the end of the day, they were both great. They got them both and they both joined the Reds team at the same time and they right. got contracts and they played their first year in 1911 with yep. the Cincinnati Reds. So Almeida and Marsans were the first two, uh, you know, Latin or Cuban players really that, that, that played in the majors. And at that time, Almeida was considered a better player, but it ended up in the long run that Marsans was the better of the two. Mm -hmm. So Almeida did play and, um, and our, 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 our Almeida was very, very well liked. And um, he was called uh, the Matador because what he would do is every time he would go up to bat, he would uh, tip his hat and bow to the pitcher and then to the fans. You know, <laughs> so they, they really liked him. But you know, he played, I think, about three to four years with the Reds. Right. Mm -hmm. And Marsans stuck on longer and he played a total of eight years. And Marsans was, I think, the first player to the first Cuban or Latin player to bat, have over 500 at bats in the majors, and and Marsans became really the uh, the 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 main Cuban player back in the 1900s. In 1900, and you you have so. cards for both of these players, right? Yeah, I was going to show uh, some of the cards. And first of all, Cuba, you know, they already had established leagues. So in 1909. The Detroit Tigers, who was the championship team at that time, you know, with Ty Cobb and Sam Crawford and all these great players, they ended up going to Cuba for a uh, for a, a barnstorming tour mm -hmm. uh, in 1909. Uh, so they ended up creating uh, tobacco cards, and they were really the first Cuban cards that were created, other than like postcards and stuff like that. You know, right. just like in the United States, uh, they created the first tobacco cards. And they created of the uh, Havana team, the Almendares team, and the Detroit Tigers team. Now, Ty Cobb did not go there. He, he, didn't, you know, he didn't go to Cuba, but most of the other players were, did go. So then they made these cards, right. which were the 1909 Cabanas. Right. And this is Armando Marsans, and this is considered to be basically his rookie card from 1909. You can see here, 1909 Cabanas. Now, I did have the Almeida of this, and I ended up trading it to another collector for, uh, mm -hmm. for the two Minoso cards, which I'll show later. But um, uh, Almeida, and there was also some other players that, and here's another Cabanas card. This is a Stevan Pratz. Uh -huh. He was also a good player. Didn't play in the United States, but he was one of the better players in, uh, in Cuba. The backs of and those the cards. Problem, the backs of the cards, they uh, have. Oh, nice. The cabanas, and it says basically it's the best uh, cigars or whatever or cigarettes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can read it. It's all in Spanish, but it's cabanas because the N has the so it's cabanas. Right. So they do have the front, and they're not blank backs. They do have a lot of writing, Spanish yeah, writing in the back. Nice. Those are nice cards. I mean, for for that time yeah. period. Absolutely. For those time period, yeah, and and oops, and the uh, the blue one is Almendares, the red one is the Havana team, and the the black borders are the Detroit Tigers team. So I dropped that. But uh, so are that's, there any uh, uh, any Hall of Famers in the Tigers uh, group? Because those have got um, to be. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah. I, they are. There are some yeah. in there, uh, and. Uh, I don't remember all of them, but there's a couple of the pitchers, the big pitchers that, that were in that team went down there. And um, yeah. I, I don't remember all the names. I'll probably look it up. So anyway, th that was one of the – I was going to show you the other card here of um, – so so this is a, a card of Almeida. Okay. This is from 1924, and this is another Cuban card. I just wanted to show you what he looked like. Now, again, right. he started in 1909, 1911. So this is 1924. So this is a little bit further up in his career. Right. But this is actually a, a photograph that's pasted on uh, 
not, it's, see, it's Almeida from 1924, and it's the Aguilitas, also a cigarette uh, company. Right. This was was stuck on an album, but you could see in the back. So uh, they do have a lot of cars of Almeida. He also has a T207 car yep. and uh, a few others. So I'll, any, I'll be looking any to pick up point, some of those. Almeida, Marsens was, a, as, we talked to, as you talked about, a more sort of established player, played longer. A, yeah. Any reason why he doesn't have a T207? Do you know? Uh, I mean, Marsens could have American cars. Right, that's... Oh, oh, he does. Okay. There it is. <laughs> that's the Marsens T207. Okay. Oh, that's a nice one. That's a four. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So... And these, they have different backs. This is the recruit. Right, the recruit. They the also color. have the rare ones, which is like the the broad leaf or a lot rarer. But see, that's, that's, yep. and these are from 1912. Yep. So this is, this is Marsan's, as you can see from 1912. Yeah, I have a few of those. And I showed you the 19, that's the 1909 Marsan's here. Yep. Okay. So, um, so, you know, Almeida and Marsan's, played for quite a few years and they played for yeah. Cincinnati and uh at later later in his career I think Marsans did go play for New York that's right uh, I yeah. have to double check that but I'm pretty sure he played for for New York after that so and uh, you know they now the um I guess the next player who the next Cuban player who becomes uh, actually a, a star is uh Adolfo Luque who um yes. I, I've sort of been um spending a lot of time trying to figure out whether he should be in the major league baseball hall of fame. And I've decided that he most definitely should be. Um, so let me just pull up, uh, let's see, is this it? Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, there's Marsans. There's Marsans. Yeah. There's Luke. And Marsans and Almeida were pretty good hitters. I mean, they ended up with yep. uh, 270 lifetime average, uh, for, uh, Marsans. I think Almeida was 269 or something like that. I didn't bring up their but, stats, but I did bring up Luque's stats. Yeah, Luque it really has incredible stats. He was one Look of the best pitchers during that era. The 1923 season for Cincinnati, he's 27-8, and eight, yeah. 1.93 ERA. If you go, he's got a lot of black ink. I looked up to see whether he was close to winning the Triple Crown because he did have 151 strikeouts, which was kind of a lot back then. Um, yeah. But Dazzy Vance had like 175 or something, so... Uh, he didn't. He didn't just miss the triple crown. But I'll tell you, if there was a, um, if there was a Cy Young in nineteen twenty three, he would have been the unanimous winner. Um, fantastic. Problem with Luke is that he pitches for Cincinnati, who's not so great in that time frame. Right. He pitched in the World Series, and I think it was nineteen. And then they're not so good in that time period, so his win loss records aren't great. But look, he wins another ERA title in twenty five. Yeah. With, with and even at that, he won. He won what 194 games, almost 200 games. Yep. So Luke and, pitches, uh, his, and he had a pretty good WAR, a WAR of 48. Yeah, yeah. The I mean, pitch he, was not bad. He's he's one of those guys that I think, if you combine his numbers with his pioneering aspect in the game, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I yeah. I, I don't know why he doesn't get more attention because I yeah. mean this this is the York Caramels card from 19. 27 which i believe you have the same car yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yours is a little better mine has like a crease right along right no here. mine has a crease also okay right yeah. here yep and i love the back of this oh yeah 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 you have oh i love too. the back because it says <laughs> the greatest cuban pitcher <laughs> which is which at the time is true right yeah. i mean they're, they're not just they're not just floating this boat this is an actual true statement so yeah Luque yeah. pitches. Remember, and, and Luque, go Luque ahead. won two two ERA titles. Yep. And two World Series. Yep. So he also, and this is the reason I got started on him. I, I'm a collector of the Braves, the Miracle Braves of 1914, and he pitched for the Braves in 14. And it, you know, he pitched for like what two games or something? Two games. One game started, and but he was only what 23 years old. And then, so that's 1914. He pitches into the mid-30s. So he's in yeah. the game for a long time also. Whoops, that's just me. Um, he's into the game for so long, and then he ends up getting a card in the 1933 Gowdy set. In the 33, yeah. 
Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? which I'm, I'm assuming, yeah, yeah, you got the five. <laughs> there it is. So, yeah, the thing about and, and there's a. Th- Go ahead. And there's also an, an, a few more cards. Let me show a few more cards of yeah. uh, Luke now that we, we're on him. There's yeah. also the Yinglings, which is right. a very similar pose, the same pose, the same picture as the uh, your care as the caramel. Right. It's the same picture, but the back is different because it has the back for the uh, the ice cream where you could redeem the Babe Ruth card and and get a right, gallon right. of ice cream or whatever. <laughs> So that's yeah, Yingling, the Yingling. It's funny because Yingling is actually a, a Pennsylvania. Well, they became a Pennsylvania brewery. Um, yes, they still exist. They're they the still oldest exist, brewery but in the, in the country, yeah. This was during the time of prohibition. Yep. So they stopped oh, doing the beer yeah, the and they got cream. into the ice cream. Yeah, because <laughs> this is 1928. Right, yeah. right, right. And right. Uh, here's another 1928. This is a W513, a hand cut. Right, okay. I've seen that card. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and and that of course has the blank back. And then the right. last one I want to show is a a Cuban card, and it's the smallest Cuban card that there <laughs> is, and it's called the 1930 Bagger Chocolate, the Bagger Chocolate, and that's the the Luque. And it's actually yep. a, a photo, a real photo, and the back. Has. Let me see if I can show it there. Here you it go. says uh, chocolate, the bagger, oops, I got it backwards. Bagger chocolates. Right. It's like a little mini card from the 1930s. And this was printed in Cuba. What years? Oh, 1930. Okay. 1930. So this, this was done in Cuba. A little Luque so, so card from Cuba. The thing about Luque, and you mentioned the two World Series, the one with the Reds where he was a major player, but he became sort of a elder statesman relief pitcher for the Giants. And um, in 1933, he pitched four plus innings in the final clinching game of the 1933 World Series. The Giants beat the Washington Senators. Um, and he pitched he pitched four, score, four plus scoreless innings. Yeah. Mel Ott hit a home run in the 10th inning. And they won the game and then won the World Series. And so Luque was a, was a key contributor to that. That yeah. not only that game but that team he he actually got MVP votes that season he he did um, get MVP votes right yeah. and he uh he what was I going to say uh yeah so he got the World Series win and that is the last World Series game in in Washington the city of Washington until the Nationals in what is it nineteen I think the Nationals were in the World Series so the historical game and I found it and I'll I'll put the link in the very uh, interesting in the oh, that's that's great. I found some home footage of this on the internet. And what I found out, and you'll never see this in the books, is that Mel Ott's home run was controversial. There's like people running on the oh, field wow. and arguing, and finally they send them around the bases. And then they win the game, and there's a little bit of a clip of them running off the field. So they win the, they win the World Series, and they just run off the field. Wow. <laughs> there's no celebrating. <laughs> there's no running around. There's no horses or whatever. They just run off the field. And, you know, they're all happy and everything. But I guess. But they, there's actual they footage it. of that. I, I've yeah, never seen yeah. that. It's like home home movie footage. It's really cool. I'll, I'll send you the link, but I'll put it in the description. For sure, also. yeah. But the funny part, I'm trying to find Luke in there, but it's too small to, to find no. it. But anyway, so he was on the mound to get out the, um, the Washington Senators, who at the time were managed by. Joe Cronin. Joe Cronin was a player manager for Washington for many years. So I got a, I got this card, which I think goes right into yes. not only the connection uh, with with Uke, who who got out. No, actually, no, Cronin got a hit in the final inning, but he batted in the final inning, but he was stranded because they lost. Um, this is the set. I, I love this set, and I know I, I brutalized the name because I don't I don't speak Spanish very much. Propagandas. Um, Montiel. Thank you. Um, and so this is this is why I have two cards of this. I have Mize and Cronin, but I know you have a bunch of these, uh, tons of them. But, which, but yeah, yeah, they're they're uh, they're a little different. They're paper thin cards, and these are again 45, 46. You can see they're from yep. Cuba. This one I got because it just got my name on it, Orlando. <laughs> but it's uh, Propagandas Montiel, and. Um, you know, they're, they're, they produced a lot of cards in, in Cuba, you know, just like they did in the United States, you know, and I, yep. I showed you cards from the 30s and 
way back up to, from 1909 because the rich history in Cuba of baseball pretty much is the same or almost as long as in the United yep. States. I mean, it's mm -hmm. from 1863 on. So they produced a lot of cards in the and some of the more famous ones are the are the forty five forty six Caramelo Deportivos, right? And and these came along pretty much at the same time that these came along, and you know they had uh, this is and, and we'll talk about him because Martin Diego it's right. it, you know everybody says Martin Diego but it's really you don't pronounce the H so it's Martin Diego it, that's how you say it in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather told me that Martin Digo was the best player ever to come out of Cuba. He saw him play and said that he was an all-around player. This is a guy that not only was a hitter, but he was a pitcher, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Caramelo Deportivos, you could see the back. This was kind of light. Some of them are a little bit easier to read. But um, I'll show you the back. A little bit there. There you go. That's a little bit better. And right. these came in candy. So these were candy cards. Right. They came in actual in, with little pieces of candy. And and these have, of course, the, the 40, 45 and 46 are the ones that have the Mini Minoso rookie. You transitioned right into what I was going to transition <laughs> yeah. into. Yeah. And, uh, and it has the... Uh, yeah, the Hugo rookie. To Luque, there's kind of a low in like major Cuban stars until yeah. Minoso. And Minoso, yes. and, and this is um this is a bit of a sensitive topic, but I think that I think you touched on you've touched on this before, is that like any country, the, the Cuban people have a wide variety of skin tones. Yeah. And one of the reasons I think that the earlier players were capable of playing without the prejudice that like a Minoso got was because they were light skin. In fact, Bay Bayon was half Irish. Um, right. And so and Luque and, actually had blue eyes. Right. L L so, so when you get to um, the forties and you get to players like Minoso, they are prejudiced against and they have to yeah. play in the Negro leagues. In fact, right. for the New York Cubans. So yeah. Minoso becomes a, a, a sort of, I, I think you've called him like the Jackie Robinson of Cuban players. Yeah. And, and, he and became, of, he was really the, the, yeah. the, the big, big star uh, during the day. And everybody recognized him. He was, he was great in Cuba and everybody knew he was going to be a star, but he had to be given an opportunity. And, and yes, he was the first Hispanic black player in the major leagues. So for, for, for Latinos, uh, he was the Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. of Latin players because he was the first, even though he wasn't the first Cuban, but he was the first black Cuban and the first right. black Latin player. And it opened the way for, you know, Clemente and all the other Latin, black Latin players to come in after that. But Minoso was really just like a Jackie Robinson, you know, but, he, you know, a lot of people don't realize it was a lot tougher for him because he didn't even speak the language or b very, you know, he didn't speak it very well, right? So it's it was a difficult for a, a black person that didn't even know this country. You know, he came, he, he didn't know this country at all, and right. to come here and get try to you know the just everything, the culture, the remember in C Cuba was totally different, Dan. There, there, there really isn't wasn't that kind of racism in Cuba that there was here in the United States. In Cuba, you know. I, I even even today my some of the best friends of my mom from Cuba are blacks because right. we lived with the black people they were our neighbors and and we played together and it was just it was you know we, we were Cubans that was it yep. we weren't mm -hmm. black or white we didn't see ourselves that way in this country it was a little bit different so I can imagine Minnie Minoso coming over here and seeing the differences you know because initially Brand, Branch Ricky interviewed another player called Silvio Garcia. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And he was the one that was first interviewed by Branch Ricky, even before he interviewed Jackie Robinson. Silvio was a black guy and he was an incredible yep. player. But when Branch Ricky interviewed him and asked him, you know, what would you do if somebody in the stands called you the N word? And then he'd say, oh, I'd kill him. Yeah. <laughs> so because, you know, the, you know, 
it, it was just one of those things that they didn't face racism until they yeah. got to this country. So Mini Minoso had to face the racism, the language barrier, the culture, everything. So that's why he's considered to be, you know, um, kind of a, a legendary uh, player like like a Jackie Robinson, more of more not just a, a baseball player, but a cultural icon. And and um, when he became a Hall of Famer, which was tragically after he passed away, yeah, um, his cards really started to become <laughs> super expensive. And I want you to show the two pre. I guess they they, they are rookie cards and first year cards, but they're they're Cuban cards. Which yes, I know yeah, I mean. Technically, yeah, this one. I mean, yeah, I guess they're a pre-rookie, but you know, he was already playing professional there in yeah. uh, in Cuba. And I think it's a little and, disrespectful to call it the pre-rookie, honestly, because he's yeah. playing he's playing professional sports at this point. He's a major exactly. star, and a major um, star, just not allowed yeah. to play with the whites. Yep, right. Yep. So that's his first year, and that was the uh, 45, 46 Caramelo Deportivo. And this is the 46-47 Carabelo Deportivo, which is his second year, Minoso's second year card. And, I, I and this is a lot more difficult a rare to find. card, right? Because I, I, don't yeah. even, I don't even know that card. The other card I've seen mm. many times, and I've seen it with, yeah. with very large price tags, which were beyond my means. But this yeah. card, I don't see that often. In fact, like no, I said, this, I don't think I've seen it before. This one yeah. is, is definitely much rarer. Uh, uh -huh. It's much tougher to find. Uh, it, again, the back, you can see the back. Uh, it's got Orestes Minoso, Caramelo Deportivo, and it talks about him in Spanish there. Yep. But yes, definitely the, the, the 46 47 is a lot more difficult because at, at that time they, in Cuba, they were producing other cards, like the propagandas and some other different kinds of cards. Um, you know, they were doing other other types of cards. This is another one they did. This is right. A, so, so I guess that forty for some reason I don't know the exact reason they printed less. I would imagine, but the that forty six forty seven right. is the most difficult uh, of the Caramelo Deportivo sets to find. Yeah. So Minoso m makes the major leagues in uh, was it fifty or fifty one? Uh, in fifty one. Right, I, think 51. I have to check exactly. 51 is when he came into the league. I think it was, right. um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> and, then, and then it's, and then 52 is the year that he really, he, he becomes a star. Essentially, he's like rookie of the year candidate, yeah. if not rookie of the year. And then yeah. he, he breaks into the, the card world. And yeah, uh, Let, you, I'll, I'll take one, his, one. Sure, go ahead. Let me take one, one step back and just finish okay. off with the Carabelo Deportivos. Because uh -huh. these cards, uh, there, there's also American players that did go to play in Cuba because a lot of players during the Winter League went to play oh, in yeah. Cuba and yep. they made cards. So that's why you see you have a card, a Propaganda Montiel of an American player. Right. Uh, even though that was a coach. But here is a Sizzler yep. who played here many years in the United States. And here's his Cuban card from the Caramelo Deportivo, 46-47. His father is uh, the famous Hall of Famer George Sisler. George Sisler is his father, exactly. Who, yeah. who and he has a brother won. also that played. Right. He had a pitcher. Uh, I can't remember the pitcher's name. But George Sisler himself was um, a completely open to people of other he, – he was not a prejudiced man, let me put it that way. Um, so there's really good stories about George Sisler, especially later in life because he stayed in the game. He had the sons and he coached and everything. And George Sisler – the great George Sisler, the hitter, it was, was in, in many respects helpful to integration. I think he might have been on the barnstorming tours also. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, well it shows because look at his son. He was playing with all the black yep. players in Cuba at the time. Yep. So uh, there was a lot of players. Here's a few guys here. And, and all these black players, this is uh, Avelino Canizares. And he played in the United States, but he played in the Negro Leagues. Here's another one, Shiflin Clark. Also played in the Negro Leagues for the New York Cubans. Tells you in the back here. Nice. If you can read it. It says New York Cubans right there. Yep. So a lot of these guys, they played. And some of them, you know, they were either black or, or, or darker skinned, you know, players. So um, 
so anyway, let's get back to Minoso because yes. Minoso really was, because, was the man. You know, and then, I, yeah, there's the 52 tops, which are card that I don't have, embarrassingly enough. Um, and the 52 oh. Bowman is a card that I don't have either, and especially which is sad because I'm collecting the 52 Bowman set, but I'll get there. Um, so oh. happy to see so let's those. Let's go with the 52 Bowman, yeah. Yeah. And, I and mean, this one, I bought this raw at the National along yeah. with the 53, and I just had them graded myself. Yeah, that's, but yeah, that's part of the They're beautiful card. The... That 50, 52 yeah. is one of the nicest cards. You know, I, it's got I the facility to... autograph on there. I have two favorite car, two of my most favorite cards in the entire hobby, are these two guys. Yeah, because these are just you know, and and one of the things about Minoso, and you talked about the difficulties he had. I think one of the great things about him and made him such a beloved player was because he just has like a a, a shine to him, a goodness to him, like he just and these cards. I mean, especially this one. I mean, how can you not fall in love with this player? You know, I mean, he just had a spirit to him, I think, that made him so likable. And this is just a classic pose, you know, and it's a 53 Bowman. So um, it's, it's of course, a profession, really re well professionally taken photograph. Um, yeah. But you have the, the autograph. Do you have yeah. a story behind the autograph? No, I bought this at the uh, not national but the past national uh -huh. and i got it uh from a guy that just had he had a few uh autographs of uh minoso and he said he personally had got him it was a dealer right and this was the oldest one he had and the nicest one he had so i bought yeah. it it was raw he was some um... that's how he signed it right on right along the bat and you know it, of course the heat the dealer told me, yeah, it's it's real, it's real. And I trusted him because he had a few others, and but I had to get it to PSA, and it was well, authentic. It, he, was, he was right. And this card I love, not only because I love that card. I love that big glove that he's got there. Exactly. I was about to say this glove, the look. The, I think that's the polo grounds behind him. It's just such a 50s card. And, again, he's got this sort of spirit about him. And what's great about Minoso, um, from my own standpoint, and, of course, the 56 has his wonderful smile on it, yeah. Uh, and him, of course, stealing a base. I'm sure he was safe. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, he, the Cuban Comet, you know, he was one of the of fastest course. players out there, you know. So what, what's beautiful for, for me about Minoso the, uh, is that. Here's the 53 tops. Right. That's another beautiful card with yeah, the smile. He's, he's again. always yep. with the smile on his face, you know, always a happy guy. And everybody that, that knew him, everybody that, you know, dealt with him would say that he was such a nice, pleasant guy, you know. I don't think he turned down autographs. He autographed until right. the end. He um he became sort of an embat he was well he was coaching with the White Sox in the seventies and I, yeah. I, I was watching baseball. Um, you know, in nineteen seventy six I was thirteen years old and I remember when he came up to bat. And you know, we didn't have the internet and I didn't I didn't live in Chicago so I didn't have T V but I, oh, I remember opening up the box score and it's in the in the the um, you know in the newspaper and seeing Minoso yeah. playing and I thought it was the coolest yeah. thing. I was like obsessed with this Minoso who yeah. was like fifty years old playing in nineteen seventy six yeah. and I love this story. And then again in, yeah. in nineteen eighty, I was in high school yeah. and I think I was I had kind of gotten out of the um, yeah. out of the, the the hobby a little bit at that point. But he batted again in nineteen eighty. Yeah, make him a five decade player, and I just the only. Interesting yeah. because he's the the only player. Hold on, cause give me what a minute happened? here. Somebody, no, I just when somebody opened the door in my house, it kind of the ring camera. Anyway, um, the 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 great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, but yeah, the best thing about him is something that you know, five decades. I mean, anybody that can play in five decades is incredible. I mean, the guy started in in the in the forties, the mid forties, as you can see in Cuba. And yep. played all the way through the 80s. I mean, at least he went up to bat in the 80s. It's <laughs> an incredible feat. And not only that, but, uh, you know, Minoso is also in, in various Hall of Fames, too. Oh, of know, course. Not just, uh, yep. you know, of course, a Cuban Hall of Fame and all that stuff. And, uh, played so in he, other he actually got a hit in 1976 as, like, yes, a 53 year old player, which to me is just was my. He went mind. one for two. Yeah. So yeah. the other thing about Minoso is that, and we talked about this, he sort of opened the floodgates. So I went through my uh, a lot of binders and my collection and everything, and, and I came up with a whole 
bunch of, of Cuban players that came into the, the 50s. And the first one I came up with was, um, was Sandy Amaros because yes. he's in my Brooklyn collection. Now, Sandy Amaros is um, a great story because in Game 7 of the 1955 World Series with two runners on in, I believe it was the sixth inning, uh, Yogi Berra hit a shot into the left field corner and San Sandy Amaros ran the ball down and caught it, turned around, threw the ball to Reese, and Reese threw it to Hodges to get a double play, completely ending that rally that the Yankees had, and they ended up winning the game. Johnny Padres yeah. pitched a complete game. So Sandy Amaros was beloved in Brooklyn for years. Yeah. And the, st the sad part about it is when he retired in the end of the 60s, and he went back to Cuba where he had, he had, had a, a farm. He had purchased a farm there with the money that he made in the major leagues, it had been seized by the Castro government. Yeah. And so he came back to the United States in the place where he was beloved. And he lived in Brooklyn for many years and he got involved in local politics, including working for Herman Badillo, who ended oh, up wow. being the first Latin um, elected official in New York city in the 1960s. So Sandy Morris that. That's great. is a really, and then he ultimately, he moved down to South Florida uh, where he yeah. did pass away after having some troubles, but, um, a great, great Cuban player, great story, and um, yeah. you know, lot, lot. You could do a whole show on him if you wanted to. And then uh, yeah, you can go through yours, so but many. I've got. Uh, uh, you, I'll, I'll butcher the names, but it's uh, Sandy. Consegra. Consegra. There we go. He's got there a fifty-six. Go. There's, so there's Sandy we'll talk Consegra. About, uh, there, there it is. The, the fifty-five. We're twins. The um, we'll talk about Camilo Pascal in a little bit, but we got him. Yes. I know you've got that card with him and Pedro Ramos, which I, a card that yeah. I don't own, and there's Ramos. Uh, there's other players like Carlos Paula, uh, Willie Miranda. Uh, I'm going to mess this one up. Jose Valde Valdez. <laughs> Va Valdez Viesco. Yeah, we go. Valdez Viesco. Middle infielders. That guy's yeah. Now you're going all the way back to some of the uh, yeah. But then we Cuban got players. But you know. here, here's a Cuban start. Uh, oh yeah, Cuba Cardinal. Artist, yeah. Who was an all-star for the Reds and then later yeah. on for the Twins? Uh, a terrific a lot, shortstop. A lot of a lot of Cuban players were called Chico. Here's Chico Fernandez. There's <laughs> Chico. kind of nicknames that that they gave them. Chico uh, Fernandez. Of Champion Bert Campanaris. Oh, Bert Campanaris, incredible player. Here's another and, uh, uh, another Chico Fernandez here. <laughs> uh, Tony <laughs> Oliva. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, of course. Tony there Oliva. <laughs> There's the great um, Camilo Pascual. Camilo Pascual. I mean, he, he you know, we'll talk about people him. don't realize that Camilo Pascual, you know, he he could be he should be considered a hall of fame i mean he, oh, yeah. he's borderline but yes. camilo was an incredible pitcher and if you look at his stats and look at what he did i mean he he should be i think more considered than he actually was we'll, we'll talk Here's about an him. autograph oh nice yeah he's also got the uh 64 top giants which i think you uh, have done. i have to thank uh my buddy hammer 44 that gave me the autograph camilo pascual Giant, nice. Top giant. I have this whole set, so it was easy for me to go oh, through. Oh, it's an awesome set. Here's Camilo up. with uh, Pedro Ramos. Right. That's the card I was talking about. I want to get that one. Right. And then, of course, Tony oh, Oliva. Oh, that's a nice Tony about. Oliva. So one of the things that Let's, I felt. Uh, and, here's and, a few and, more. And Luis, uh, Luis Tiant, of course. Camilo Pasquale. Yep. So Just kind of flash some cards out there. Before I get into this, to the, the autograph 1970s, guys, I do want to talk about Camilo Pascual because I know you have the fifty, the fifty-six, and the fifty-seven, and right. I do have the sixty-seven, but I also have the seventy autograph. And we'll get into that. Yeah, he won over two hundred games. Right. He came up in nineteen. His, his rookie card. I think there's a fifty-five, which is a, his actual rookie card. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he pitched. He had some periods where he was hurt, but then he came back in in the mid sixties. He was a twenty-game winner. He was a dominant pitcher. He's, he got like six all-star game appearances and then he got hurt later in his career yeah. and he was a reliever for like the Reds and a few you other You know, the teams. funny thing is that when he yeah. first started, Dan, he had a terrible record in the beginning. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. his record was like 30 and 66 or 30 and lost 70. 
And then all of a sudden, boom, he came back strong and he had an incredible career after that. His first yep. three or four years were terrible. But after well, that, remember, I mean, 200 game winner, he was a center. strikeout pitcher. They, they said that he had one of the best curveballs ever. Mm-hmm. And that was said by uh, Ted Williams said that he had one of the best curveballs that he had ever seen. That so Camilo Pasquale had. Camilo Pasquale is still alive. This is an autograph. This is a TTM. Um, which took a while to get returned. I believe he's living in South Florida right now with yes, his he son. Is. Actually, right. his his daughter worked with my sister. Oh, okay. And that's how I got the autographs because she took it to work, gave it to the daughter. The daughter went to see Camilo and got it. But Camilo is <laughs> now close to 90 years old. Yep. But he still has a very great, clean autograph. I was you know, about it's, to it's, say, this is such a beautiful autograph. And I don't know, I don't remember if I, you know, a lot of the TTMs, you got to put a $10 bill in. Um, I don't remember. I think maybe because he's such a prominent player, I think I was a $10 bill. But the what, the weird thing about this picture is that it's a 1970 card, but it's the same photograph as the 1967 yeah. card. <laughs> they do that so much, you know. <laughs> That's unfair. So I, I just then... wanted to go through some of these other players. We talked about. Let, we got. Man. We got to talk about Camilo. The next big picture, picture, Cuban picture yes. after Camilo. We got to put Louis Tion in there. Of course. And, and Louis and Tion, I Hall think, should be Hall of Fame, one hundred percent. So Tion, what he did was incredible. That's his that's, rookie. I love that autograph you have. That's his rookie. Well, let me tell you a little bit of the story about this autograph. You know Tion's career. He is a dominant pitcher. For the Indians, 1968, he has one of the best seasons uh, of the of the decade, and he's a terrific pitcher. And then he and then he gets his arm, he gets arm injuries. He gets traded to the Twins, where he does nothing because he's hurt. And then um, he goes, he gets released. He goes to Atlanta. He gets released, and then the Red Sox take a flyer on him. He's all of a sudden healthy, and he becomes this great pitcher for the Red Sox for many years. But you so, know, one of the things that ha- that he did, Dan. That kind of changed. Uh, he changed his his windup, and he did that crazy yeah. looking up type pitch windup. He also became, confi- he became like a, a similar more, to the Fernando Valenzuela right. type thing, you know. He started instead of being a power pitcher, he became a, a finesse pitcher, and he had all sorts of different curveballs and stuff, and it was great. So I mean, I remember watching him pitch on television. He would he fool the yeah, yeah yeah, and we used to imitate his windup out in the playground, you know. But anyway, so Tion. Um, the, I got this autograph at a, a, a get together called Pinstripe Pride. It was a pre-COVID event in New Jersey where it was a ton of Yankees, and so Tion came in as essentially, you know, he played for the Yankees later on in his career. Yeah. Um, he had the famous uh, the f- he came to the Yankees in '79 after the '78 collapse of the Red Sox, and he had this famous commercial on television for hot dogs. And uh, the, the tagline was, um, it's great to play for a wiener. <laughs> for a wiener. <laughs> yeah, because... And a winner because the Yankees had won. So anyway, the great to play for a wiener. Um, anyway, so Tiant, I hand him this card and he frowns. You know, he's a smiley guy. He's friendly. He's talking yeah. to everyone. And he sees this card. He frowns. And I'm wondering, like, I'm put giving this because I collect all these 70s autographs. It's my first set. And so I hand him this card, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, I just gave him a card of a year that he wants to forget. You know, there isn't even – there's a 71 Tion, but there's no 72 Tion. He literally um, doesn't have a card in the 72 set because they thought his career was over. But anyway, so he signed the card. He wasn't happy about it, but he did sign the card, and it's a beautiful signature. Did he tell you why he didn't like the card or just he, – he, he, I didn't even want to ask him about it because I realized as soon as I put it in front of him that I – that yeah. I had just yeah. brought up the because if I had given him the, the Cleveland Indians, it would have been oh yeah, great. I was one of the greatest pitchers in the world in 1968, or right. the the Red Sox where he was a World Series hero. Yeah, I mean they didn't win, but he was not the reason why they didn't win. Or, right. or Yankees, right? Because it was a Yankee yeah. event. Yeah. So he was um, a beloved player everywhere. I mean, everywhere he played, they loved him. And, and let me show you another. We we talked about Leo Leo Cardenas, okay, Mike Cuellar, right? So I I do not have Cuellar a because by Cuellar. he was a dominating pitcher in the in the sixties and and uh, in the seventies with the Orioles. Yep. I mean, twenty game winner. 
Mike Cuellar won. Uh, well, they traded from Houston. He had been he had sort of come out and and pitched well for Houston in the last year. So they traded him for Bleffrey, who had been a a, a big uh, sort of uh, early hitter and been like a power hitter, yeah. year maybe. And then so they got they got Cuellar. Cuellar then all of a sudden became an ace type pitcher. Yeah. He won the Cy Young in 1969. He tied with mm-hmm. with McLean. They both won the Cy Young. And I would say Cuellar won 20 games like six times already. A bunch of times, yeah. I'm not sure. I think it was maybe four or five times. But him along with, of course, you know, Palmer and uh, all yep. the other guys in the Orioles, they had – one time they had four 20-game winners on the staff. Yep. McNally. Like yep. And Cuellar pitched – I believe he pitched the winning game in the 1970 World Series when they when they won the championship over the Reds. Yeah, yeah I believe um, so We too, talked yeah. about yeah. Leo Cardenas. This is a um, – this is a uh, TTM. Um, yeah. Cardenas, uh, you know, was an all-star with the Reds and the Twins. Right. And um, was yeah. part of the Twins teams that won, um, you know, won the divisions in 69 and 70. Terrific ball player. A couple guys I talked about, Orlando Pena, the first player I've ever met yes. Yes. in person was Orlando Pena. Uh, another good Cuban player, Tony Taylor. I got you. a good player during his yep. time. Tony and, Taylor. Yeah. Autograph. And let's let's get into the uh, the Hall of Famers that we haven't talked about. Yes, the last Tony two Perez. that we should talk about are Perez and Tony Oliva. Oliva. Now, Tony Perez, you mentioned the National. Tony Perez was at the National in Atlantic City, and he looks great. And uh, I got his autograph. He did not have a long line, which which was kind of surprising to me. Yeah. Um, because he was, I guess, because he was right next to Johnny Bench, who had a very yeah. Long he line. signs a lot too. So he does sign a lot. So Tony Perez, yeah. I go up to him, such a gentleman, so smiley and friendly, and shook my hand and everything, and it was just such an honor because, um, as you know, uh, in in a way, kind of an underappreciated player because he was on yeah. those teams with with Rose and Morgan and. And bench exactly. Um, but, you know, he was. You, you could pencil him in for 100 RBIs every season, and yeah. that to me was up. Uh, and then, you know, they well, traded him. Yeah. When they traded Perez to the Expos, I think they took the heart out of that Reds team, and they never won again. You know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so in my Oliva. opinion, I think. In my opinion, Tony Perez was was the best Cuban player. I think in the majors. If you really look at the majors, his. Mm-hmm. I think his stats probably one of the better for Cuban players uh, during yep. his era, you know. And then you got Tony Oliva. Tony yeah. Oliva uh, signed this at the Hofstra show. Um, Beautiful signature. He, yeah. I mean, do you see, you notice that a lot of, in Cuba, we were always taught how to sign our name, you know, cursive and all of that. And still today, you know, at least for my kids, I, I taught them and all that. And if you look at the Cuban players, you could read their name on the autographs. You could read it. I, I want to show one more. Yeah. Tito oh, Fuentes. Oh, that's a great one. Tito Fuentes. And, and, you, and I was just about to say that all of these signatures are absolutely gorgeous. And, and they're so legible. Tito, Tito Fuentes is a uh, pioneer himself. Yes. Not only was he a you know a great second baseman and a very flashy player, which was you know sort of held against him in many respects. Uh, hit a home run in the 1971 playoffs for the Giants in the only game that they won. But Tito Fuentes became uh, the first Spanish language broadcaster in um, the New York in the, in the San Francisco Giants history. And I wow. don't know if he was the first Spanish language broadcaster for an American team. But he is, he was, and he, he was a broadcaster for the Giants for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Wow. Uh, he only retired in the last 10 years or so. But I think yeah. it was 81 he became the Spanish language broadcaster. So also. Great story. Um, I love that. Lots, lots and then of again, money. you know, we talked about Tony Oliva, batting leader, batting champ. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, one of the great hitters in his era, you know, and, and, and so- beloved by the twins. I mean, he is just. Uh, yep. The, the thing about Oliva, there, Oliva came into the league, and I think he won three batting championships in the '60s, mm-hmm. and um, he was w- one of the best pure hitters in major leagues. But he had yeah. knee issues, and the knee problems were right. were an issue for him. And it's funny because yeah. um, they talk about the designated hitter being such a bad thing. The designated hitter extended the career of Tony Perez. In fact, he won another batting it title as designated hitter in I exactly, believe '63 which helped, I believe, helped him get into the Hall of Fame. 
you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely so, did. Uh, Orlando, I think we've reached the end. All right. Uh, well, we could, we one could last go thing. On forever. We, okay, we can one go last on thing. forever. But I'll go, <laughs> uh, I just, uh, a couple more, because we talked all the way up to the 70s. Okay. And then when you get to the 80s, you had some of the, unfortunately, the PED issues, but right. some of the greatest, more ta most talented players, uh, Cuban players played during that era of the 80s. Rafael Palmero, 500 home runs, 3,000 hits. Probably will never be in the Hall of Fame, but you can't talk about him. Uh, you know, I mean, in the 80s, he was one of the big, big hitters yep. there. And, of course, the, the big boy, Canseco, you know. I mean, 40-40, yep. uh, he changed the game with his speed and power in the time. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that they, uh, you know, they got into the, the, the PEDs, but, you know, yeah. those are some more Cuban, great Cuban players that you have to kind of consider as, in the history of major leagues. Yeah, they're, they're um, you know, star-crossed, so to speak. I remember Palmero coming up and just having the sweetest swing when he was on the Cubs. And, yeah. You know, it's a shame because I think he could have been a Hall of Fame player yeah. with that, without the PEDs. He would have uh, been without the PDs, enough. and he didn't take the PDs yeah. until later in his career. Much later in his career, uh, yeah. if he won, he he was definitely a Hall of Famer. I mean, he would have been a Hall of Famer. He still ended up with over 500 home runs and over 3,000 hits. Yep, yep. And, uh, and I think he would have. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he would have, even without PDs. I think Palmero would have done it. I mean, Canseco, that's yeah. a different issue, you know. Yeah, but, I don't know what part of Canseco's career didn't include PDs. Um, yeah, you know, maybe his first couple of years, but. It's yeah. funny you show that card because I, I I got back into the hobby in the, in the mid to late eighties because my nephew was like seven eight years old at the time and he was going crazy over baseball cards so I was yeah. like oh let's let's I'm I'm into that stuff. this let's one this yeah. card and the Mattingly yeah. eighty four Dunbar Mattingly were yeah. it in that yeah. era you know yep um sir it's been fun my friend we've already uh, going to about an hour pleasure to talk to you. Um, you know, everybody says you're you're the nicest guy in the hobby, and I agree with that. But I think people have to understand that you're also incredibly filled with with information, and knowledge, and experience. And like I said in the intro, and I, I, I see cards on your on your your um on your videos, and I say, oh, I can just picture him going over that at a show and and saying, okay, this is the I, this is the I that you that you it's like um you know it's a gift. And so um, I'm so honored that you came on my show, sir. And uh, it's such a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this Cuban thing, like I said, we could go on forever talking about these yeah. players. Um, and at this point, um, we're almost at an hour. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to cut it short. But um, again, thank you so much for being on the show, Orlando. Anytime, Dan. I really appreciate it. So just... Uh... Let's do it again sometime for sure. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. And and I'm happy to go on your channel and talk about any card thing you ever All want right. to talk about, sir. So um, Thanks, viewers, we will have um, guests, another guest next week um, I, that we'll talk about uh, during the week. Uh, probably have a midweek show. Also, um, I've got guests lined up for now the next like six weeks or something. So show is really going great. And if, if these are the, the types of guests we keep getting, uh, we're, we're feeling pretty good about it. So thank you, sir. Thanks, viewers. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Dan. Have a good one.